we are now uh, in the point in the week of seven, the 70th week, we are in the point where the 7 tribulations as shown on your chart, the 7 bowls in the week of tribulation in the, the 7 bowls have been poured out. That is what we stopped at uh, the week, 2 weeks prior and we are repeating the last week's uh, uh, presentation. We saw the 7 vials of wrath. The first one caused painful boils on all the inhabitants of the earth who had taken the mark of the beast and the name of the beast. The second one uh, caused the oceans to turn into blood. All the uh, creatures in the ocean died. The second, uh, the third seal was poured out on the rivers and heads of rivers. So, all the rivers turned to blood. And the fourth caused the sun to scorch the inhabitants. The fifth vial caused deep darkness. It was poured out on the seat of the Antichrist. And there was deep darkness in all the kingdom of Antichrist. At that point, from I gather from what is written in Revelation, all the world may not have been under Antichrist. The sixth vial caused the river Euphrates to dry up. So, that the kings of the east, the kings of the east as I said is only speculation because it has not been specified, but considering that China would be very pop, uh, powerful, India would be powerful and some other eastern nations would be powerful. So, the kings of the east will come across river Euphrates and the seventh caused a massive earthquake. The Jeruz city of Jerusalem was divided into three parts. The islands and the mountains of the world disappeared and large hailstones almost weighing 30 pounds, 30 kilos fell on the population. Yesterday in Texas, there was a big hailstorm and the hail was 1.9 pound weight, it's 9 inches by width. So, it is coming. So, it is coming. You see, these are the signs which are uh, coming. You can check on the internet. It was a big hailstorm, big size 1.9 pound uh, uh, hail, hailstones. That is the size. That was the biggest hailstone ever has fallen in the world. And so, from now, I want to just go about uh, this um, from the 16th chapter is ends the 7 vials of the wrath of God. Then the 17th and 18th chapter dis entirely describes the destruction of Babylon. Babylon has been in part of this whole um, biblical, um, you know, what you call uh, the biblical uh, history. Babylon has been prominent in various areas. Now, before I start this section of the Bible study, I would like to make a, a disclaimer. The views and opinions expressed in the study of the book of Revelation are not intended to malign Catholicism or any other religion, ethnic group, club or organization, any company or individual. It is entirely my views based on research. If any of you want any time, you want to know which part has come from where, I will be glad to uh, give you that information. Let us continue. Babylon was founded by Nimrod. Nimrod was a mighty hunter before God and Genesis 10.10 10 says that the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Babel is Hebrew word for Babylon. Babylon and Babel mean the same thing. It means confusion. It, the Babylon has been from the last nearly 5500 years, Babylon has been in existence. By this time, by the time that Antichrist is on the scene and the last week of tribulation, Babylon will be the vehicle on which the Antichrist will start to bring the religion into one, one religion and he will try to take over the world. And uh, knowledge of history is very, very critical in this. Um, there, is, there are a couple of books you can read, the two Babylons 
uh, is one of the book you can read and it will give you a um, almost um, you know um, century by century history of Babylon and the gods and the rulers and who were controlling it in very very well put that book. So, and uh, the 17th chapter of Revelation will put Babylon into a perfect into a perfect perspective of what we have been seeing. 17 and 18 de depict the destruction, destruction of the kingdom. Chapter 17 describes the religious destruction, whereas chapter 18 describes the political destruction of Babylon. To understand chapter 17, it is necessary to study some historical events which lead to what Babylon is today. We need to study that, so we will be doing that now uh, in a uh, in a very short history because we don't want to you know deviate into history rather than going with what the Book of Revelation is saying. So Revelation 17:1. Let's read it together. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked to me, saying, "Come hither." I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon the many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. The, the Bible uses very strong words when we, any individuals or the Israel, nation of Israel or any country causes uh, start to worship idols it is called adultery or it, there it is also this uh, it's uh, especially judah and israel were known as whores means they left the king of kings and went in search of other gods the implication of course is spiritual as you will see in the chapter much of the allegories are spiritual the inhabitants and one point about this is with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. The kings of the world have committed a fornication. It is the, the uh, you know the teaching and the doctrine and the practice of Babylon was spread throughout the world using the kings of Europe specifically and also other places and that the Bible calls the they committed fornication and mean made with the drunk with the wine of a fornication is very important because uh, inhabitants of the earth in the sense people who uh, are the uh, Roman Catholic Church believers or today which is known as otherwise Babylon we will come to that in a few minutes believe something called transubstantiation they believe that the bread and the wine uh, when they are doing communion they call it Eucharist because they believe the bread and the wine become the real blood and the real uh, body of Lord Jesus Christ. So this wrong doctrine is known as the wine of our fornication. It is a practice which makes the bread as sacred and the wine as sacred as Lord Jesus Christ. And this is scripturally incorrect and this is the wine of the fornication. She, and it says, she sits upon many waters. You see, whenever the Bible talks about large bodies of waters, when it is giving, when in a prophecy or anywhere in scripture, they, she is talking about large number of people. Today, more than 2.7 billion Christians more than 60 percent of them are Roman Catholics. So, he is talking about large seats on many bodies or many waters. Then, again, uh, and the kings, um, so if you have any questions about this, I will be glad to answer in the end. So, as we continue, Revelation 17 3, it says, So, he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit on a scarlet color beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. This is not the first time we have seen the beast. 
we have seen it already revelation 13 1 and there we saw that i and as john says as i stood upon the sand of the sea i saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads ten horns why is this popular seven heads ten horns because we saw in the 12th chapter the dragon that is the devil what does he have seven heads ten horns and upon these horns of this um, beast there are ten crowns and blasphemy is written upon the head of the beast and uh, we also know now the color of the beast is scarlet color the woman is sitting on the beast indicates there is a person riding this beast or controlling this beast or just riding along and the woman also rules this antichrist okay so we will come to this woman in a in, a, in the next uh, bit and we will see it then we i have got a picture here which will show you what it looks like an artist has one done a wonderful picture so this is how it must be because we can only imagine it uh, what the beast looked like of course the crowns are missing in this but i thought this was the best picture i found uh, just to put you into perspective the babylonian empire was the part of the vision what uh, nebuchadnezzar had in daniel second chapter the head was nebuchadnezzar he inherited the babylonian kingdom then come the medo persian empire which darius was the ruler then come the grecian empire which inherited from greece medo persian and alexander the great established the grecian empire from the grecian empire there came the roman empire and then rome ruled for a long time till about 313 years and then constantine who was emperor at that time moved his head quarters from rome to constantinople and declared it a christian state and it is now known as the holy roman empire 600 to 700 years before uh, john wrote this daniel uh, was asked to explain about this vision what i want to say is there have been many empires some of them are bigger than these four empires but why does the bible stick to the babylonian empires the reason is all the other empires came and died and went away whether it is jangish jangis khan or whether it is ottoman empire all of these empires died but only the roman empire is metamorphizing and continuing in different kingdoms towards the end the roman empire will be revived the antichrist seat in the in the western europe and the na nation headquarters religions nation uh, international headquarters will be in rome so the bible has said for the last 200 or 2000 years that this is what it is going to be the if you see the roman empire is the two legs at the uh, of the statue uh, if you check history about the roman empire they were it was first when alexander died it was divided into four and then it was changed to two empires eastern empire and western empire the eastern empire broke away um, uh, no when it sorry before that when they become uh, when they became a roman catholic church the eastern empire broke away because they said we can't submit to your um, teaching and they became the orthodox church the western empire became the roman catholic church there are 2.5 billion christians 2.7 billion christians today and if you include all sorts of uh, uh, all sects of christianity 31.5 percent of the population are christians today nearly 868 million are evangelicals pentecostals and charismatics the majority of the others are roman catholics and if you see uh, before we go here if you see the foot the uh, if you read daniel 2 it talks about the feet they 
are a mixture of iron and and mud clay and they are having 10 toes keep this in mind because later on we will see more of uh, this 10 toes the revival of the roman religion will be a blend of christianity and and um, lots of other religions today the pope is calling for unity of all religions you see and in those days when the toe is uh, in the world when the feet are in the world the daniel 244 says and in the days of this king shall the god of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all the kingdoms and stand forever this is the prophecy of lord jesus coming in in the in power on the cloud with the trumpet and he will come on uh, and the on, on the mount uh, so this is what is going to be the you see by that time by that time already they would have united all religions um, you know uh, constantine called himself um, in the place of god uh, and he, he he was the first guy who was called in the place of god anti christ anti means it is this um, it um, talks about in place of um, you will see uh, you see um, the roman catholic kings king constantine called himself pope we'll come to that pope and all the popes called themselves infallible and unchangeable it means they cannot make mistakes and they don't change the catholic church is standing today as a vehicle to for the final ecumenic ecumenical means unity of all religions you will see that happening because already the pope has put into action already these things satan is the power behind the antichrist everyone who receives the mark of the beast and the number of the beast will worship the beast many of those who don't bow down to the image of the beast will be killed a modified one world religion a form of christianity will be the religion of the day at that time religion has been power behind the throne for all these four kingdoms we saw babylonian kingdom mede and persian kingdom the grecian kingdom the roman kingdom there are always religion has stood behind all of this and the woman in the on the beast represents the new religion now i want to just mention something about the antichrist anti means it's a prefix in greek it comes from two possibilities are there anti means opposed to which we know anti gravity matter anti gravity means opposed to gravity but and also anti means in place of or substitute greek uses in both meanings now you see in second thessalonian 2 4 who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called god um, sitteth in the temple of god showing himself that he is god this is what the bible says the antichrist is going to pretend what happened to my cursor Sorry about that, I lost my cursor. Yeah. Yeah, some notes on Antichrist. Everyone who, uh, who receives the mark of the beast will be allowed to function. Many who don't down, bow down to the image of the beast will be killed. A modified one world religion, a form of Christianity will be the religion of the day. Okay. And the anti, as I was explaining, is it means opposed to or in place of. 
if the, um, the Antichrist, he is going to work, be, uh, you know, portray himself or pretend to be Christ and the world is going to worship him. Revelation 13, 8, we saw that. And of course, his followers will be called Christians. We Christians who believe in Lord Jesus Christ, who are there in those times, will be called heretics or people who need to be killed. Not communism, but Christianity will take over the world. You see, when John saw this vision, the Bible says he was surprised. If it was something strange, he would not be surprised. He is seeing the church sitting on the beast. Uh, the Latin equivalent of anti is vicarious, which, it's, which is from which comes the vicar. Now, the vicar of Christ literally means Antichrist or in place of Christ. The Roman Catholic popes have been called or they call themselves the vicar of Christ. They represent Christ in his place for centuries. They were, you see, Constantine started it and it became a practice. Constantine, the first Roman emperor who became Christian in 1313 AD and from he brought the Roman religion into the practice of the uh, into the practice of Christianity and he, he said, I am the head of the church and I am also the head of the Roman uh, idolatric religion, head of the church and head of the Roman idolatry and he called himself Vicarius Christi, means in the place of Christ. Subsequently over the years, the, ch the head of the church has become the ruler of the kingdoms and uh, the the idea of the Pope is that all sects of Christianity will come under the rule of the Roman Empire. Top, otherwise, he is known as the Top Father or Papa or Pope. All of these are the same words as the world now call him. Without the Pope, there is no Catholic Church. Any questions? Last days, Christians last days Christianity. The church is, today the church is being prepared for a takeover. False teaching, counterfeit teaching, counterfeit Christianity is coming slowly into the church. The church is being prepared for a takeover. Now, many of us Christians hardly know Christ. How will we know whether we will be deceived or not? It is time, my dear brothers and sisters, to, to for revival to occur, for us to make effort to know Christ. Now this Nimrod named the city Babel because they started to build a tower. They started to build a tower and they said we want to reach heaven with this tower. We do not want to follow God, but we want to follow our own design. We want to just go up there. And they were all engaged in this one focus, one thing. and the Lord came down to look at it and he said, what these people are doing is not good. So, he scattered them by confounding the language. Suddenly, people could not understand each other. God did that. Why did he do that? If you turn to Acts 17, 26, 27, on Mars Hill in, in Athens, Paul declared, that God separated the races and nations so they can concentrate on, upon seeking Him. Now, today, the idea of the world is, all of us, let us come together. Let us put aside our differences. Let us put aside our problems and we will all unite together. The solutions of man's ills will come through uni unity, uniting scientific knowledge, uniting political knowledge, uniting general knowledge and will turn in earth into paradise again. That is the plan today. What God scattered in Genesis, man now wants to unite and go back to the time of Babel. You see, Babel is the crown of the Nimrod effort. History, um, Babel is alive today. I am going to show it to you in a few minutes. God's um, scattering people want to come together. The pyramid of the Old Testament, the tall church steeples, the beautiful, beautifully built churches are all examples of imitation of Babel. 
desire to reach God other than his way. That was the whole attempt. And today man, as I said, is trying to unite what God has scattered. This is the advertisement was on a 1989 Lockheed advertisement. They put the Tower of Babel and uh, the right write up says that we have to come together. Integration, that is the way we have to develop knowledge. All of us have to pull in our knowledge and come together exactly like what they were doing in Babel. This is the, and you will be surprised, this was the EU poster when EU was, uh, when EU was formed. It shows the Tower of Babel and it shows the 12 stars like a pentagram. This, uh, they want to say that many tongues, one voice. Many tongues, one voice. You see the rebellion against God. God scattered and they are saying, now we will uh, join together. I know many, many of us have already, you know, subscribed to this thinking, oh, why not? If all of us come together, we can make the earth a better place. But that is not going to happen, my dear brothers and sisters. This is a rebellion against God. And I, you take a two, two euro coin, you will see on the other side of the coin, it is a woman riding a beast. They are not hiding from you and me. They are doing this openly. They are clearly saying, we are the uh, last day Babylon. Uh, many other large corporations have incorporated the Tower of Babel in their advertisement. They want to unite all people under one. And in uh, God said in Genesis 11, 6, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, for and now nothing will be restrained from them which they imagine to do. See, God is not talking about scientific development here. God is not talking about political development. He is talking about the evil which they imagine to do. John said that this Babylon will be alive in the last days. The forehead of the woman, we, we just saw briefly, will have the words, Mystery Babylon. Babel and as I said, Babel and Babylon are the same thing in Hebrew. We will also see what is this mystery all about. I am going to read 17, 4 to 6 and we are going to take it verse by verse after that because I want to read it so you have a whole picture of this image of this uh, uh, strange beast and the woman what John saw. Revelation 17, 4 to 6, the Bible says, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was written the name Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. The attention is on the woman. Who is this woman? First thing, she is a whore. Because there is a mention of blood of saints and martyrs, we should realize that this is a spiritual allegory. A whore is a woman who sells her body for money. So, if, if, a, if a city is following idolatry and abandoning God, the Bible calls uh, it adultery or whore. The woman represents something called Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. The angel explains, if you see um, 1718, he says, this woman is that great city. Which city? The city which sits on seven hills. Historically, even now, there are more than 50 cities who are on seven hills. But how do we know which city the Bible is talking about? There are, uh, there are seven indications given here, we are going to go through that list as to prove that the, there is a particular city that God is speaking about here. This, it, this Bible is now talking about Rome, the city of Rome, uh, the Rome and Vatican. Vatican is a smaller city in Rome, but for all practical purposes, Vatican 
rules Rome. So, Rome and Vatican are interchangeably used. If you see some prote protests in Italy or US when the Pope came, they said the one, one of the posters said Rome's way or highway. They always call Vatican and Rome interchangeably. Number one, the Bible calls it uh, Babylon. Peter writing his first letter from Rome in 1 first Peter 5 13, he writes the church that is at Babylon. He was writing from Rome and he called it Babylon. The scripture uses Rome and Babylon interchangeably at least five times. Then uh, second uh, clue here we find is mystery. Mystery is at the very heart of the Roman Catholic religion. There is mystery of the bread and wine turning into the actual blood and body of Lord Jesus Christ. The apparitions or the visions of Mary you will see around the world and many priests having specific powers which are not very easily explainable, but they call it a mystery. The Roman Catholic faith itself is mysterious and nobody is supposed to question it. Romans, uh, uh, Rome's new catechism, if you read it was released in 90, uh, 1994, explains the liturgy or the process or their, uh, you know, the practice of the church liturgy aims, it says here in that page 164, aims to initiate souls into the mystery of Christ and, and they declare that all of the church liturgy is a mystery. Mystery is a very uh, dear word for the practice of the Roman Catholic Church. The third thing, she is called whore who has committed fornication with the kings of the earth. We already saw that she involved the kings around Europe and she ruled the kings of Europe and got them involved into idol, idol, idol worship and abominations. Uh, Rome and Vatican, as I said, are interchangeable. Vatican is the power. The church, Catholic church is today known as a Roman Catholic church. It's not just Catholic church. Fourth, the fourth evidence he gives is it's covered with jewels. Dressed in purple, dressed in scarlet, jewels and decked with gold, precious stones, pearls. These are the things. You see, um, the Roman Catholic Church is the most, is the richest church in the world. Nobody has an estimate of the wealth of the Roman Catholic Church. In some time ago, one of the churches in Italy, they, they had to break down, they had thousands of gold and jewel ornaments in there. They, in fact, I do not know if the church itself knows how much riches are sitting there. They, they are covered. Then the fifth thing is, is, she is the mother of harlots. All priests and nuns are called to be celibate. This is an ungodly requirement. God never asked us to do that. And many atrocities are made by them because they cannot bear the celibacy. That is when the harlots come in. And then sixth clue is drunk with the blood of saints or martyrs. Millions and millions of Christians have been killed or burnt because of their faith by the Catholic Church. They are drunk. She is not drink with, drunk with alcohol, not with whiskey, but with the blood of saints. It is so many. If you just you have to read uh, Fox's book of martyrs, to get an idea what it is. The seventh clue is, it is reigning over the kings of the earth. Today, Catholic Church is still the most powerful. There are many leaders who go and have one on one meeting with the Pope. They do not do that with anybody else. They only do it with Pope. So, we, we are going to see little more of it. So, now that we have seen, got an idea of this woman in this four, three verses, we will go individually. <clears throat> and the woman was arrayed in purple, scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. What are the colors of Pope and Cardinals? Usually they are scarlet and purple. The whole colors of the theme of the Roman Catholic Church 
is scarlet and purple. You see, I am going to show you a picture of this skeleton. This is one of the skeletons found among the hundreds underneath the Vatican. They are covered with jewelry. Nobody knows who they are. They know some, they do not know about all of them, but they are covered with jewels. Thousands and thousands of jewelry, they are decked with gold and precious stones. This is the cardinals, they are wearing scarlet clothes. They always wear scarlet, that is the practice. You see the Pope here is wearing scarlet clothes. Other color is that he is wearing uh, is purple. This is the royal colors. They always think they are a royalty. And I want to just bring your attention to the cap. It is an odd shaped cap. This cap is shaped like this. And if you see on from the top, as you see this cardinals wearing, it is like the mouth of a fish. Actually, this cap represents the god Dagon, the god of the Philistines. It is a fish god. See, you, the, this is worn as a sign of worship to the fish god. It has been carried on from the uh, Babylonian practice. If you, you will see, if you check history, it has been carry on, carried on till the present day. The second thing is, as I said, the, the woman was carrying a cup. We saw that. The, the cup is the one of the most important things in the Roman Catholic um, religion. Um, the Catholic Ency Encyclopedia declares it like this. It is the most important of the sacred vessels and may be of gold or silver. And if it is of silver, the inside must be surfaced of gold. The cross which is worn by the priest around, uh, around the neck and it has to be made of gold and precious jewels. It cannot be of any other material. So, this cup is full of abominations because they say the wine they pour into that cup is full, is becomes the real blood of Lord Jesus Christ. This is abomination before God. This is what the uh, uh, the sign was, uh, you know, the uh, what uh, John saw and wrote. This is what he wrote about. And Revelation 17, 5. And upon her forehead was written the name Mystery. We saw what Mystery was. Babylon the Great. The mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. The Roman Catholic Church has insisted on celibacy or single, being single for popes, priests and nuns. But many of them, including the popes, have violated their vows. Rome is the mother of harlots. Hundreds of priests have been indicted in courts for abusing children, pedophiles. History is replete with sayings that mocked the church's false claim of celibacy and revealed the truth. In fact, there was a, there is a couple there are a couple of sayings in Rome. If you read um, the Roman history, the holiest hermit has its own whore. And another saying is. Rome has more prostitutes than any other city because she has the most celibates or single people. These are the sayings about Rome. You can find that if you search in Google, you will search, you will find many resources about it. And one of the popes, Pius II, declared that the Rome was the only city run by bastards, or the, which were sons of popes and cardinals. Um, Catholic historian and former Jesuit. Peter de Rosa writes, Pope had mistresses of 15 years of age, were guilty of incest and sexual perversions of every sort, had innumerable children, were murdered in the very act of adultery by jealous husbands who found in them in bed with their wives. In, there is an old Catholic saying, why be holier than the popes? The, to call any of these men his holiness or vicar of Christ is itself an abomination. The doctrine, the practices together are an abomination to God, in front of God. So, you will see. And then the last uh, thing we are going to see is, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of saints and with the blood of martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Drunken with the blood of saints and martyrs. From 1790 to 1992, 300 years in Spain, 
more than 3 million people were condemned to jail or death in the inquisition. More than 300,000 people were killed. Just to give you an idea in Spain alone, there were thousands of protestants who were killed due to their faith. The Roman Catholic Church has never apologized for it. And today many of the protestant leaders are um, um, saying, oh, we have to become one with the Roman Catholic Church. But their, pro their policies have never changed. Their policies has always been to bring the Christians back to the fold. That has been their plan all along. They started corrupting the Bibles, bringing false teaching, sponsoring counterfeit uh, um, teaching and counterfeit Christianity among other things. They even brought about a counterfeit filling of the Holy Spirit, counterfeit tongues, all counterfeit. All killings were up approved by the popes. So they could not even acknowledge it. They cannot ask forgiveness because the Pope, as you know, cannot make any mistake. Everything what the Pope says is correct. And millions of Jews were killed. Lots, lots of atrocities. You see, the woman thou sawest, I am coming back to what the Bible is saying, is the great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Consider this, Vatican City has its own government appoints its own ambassadors to the countries of the world. All leaders make pilgrimage to visit the Pope. The leaders are the Pope as Holy Father or Holiness. Even Putin, the dictator of Russia, met Pope recently for almost an hour. Most leaders have already met the Pope, whether it is Obama went and met him twice, then Trump, President Trump met him. Vatican is a very tiny city. It is half a kilometer square, but commands great authority. The evangelical leaders are in line to meet the Pope. Muslim leaders had a meeting with the Pope. Buddhist leaders had meeting with the Pope. Pope Francis blessed Muslim leaders and asked for their blessing. Recently, uh, it was Earth Day. Pope Francis said, we have sinned against the earth. The dragon is showing its true colors. In the recent meeting in Thailand last year, Pope Francis indicated that he wants to unify all religions and all governments under one world order for the sake of peace. You see, the time is coming, my dear brothers and sisters. It, it, the true colors of Rome, true colors of Babylon is coming out. You see, I am just showing you a picture of Putin meeting with the Pope. You see how quietly he is sitting there. There is no more of that arrogance of a dictator, but he is sitting there in front of the Pope. And here are some of the evangelical leaders who went to meet um, uh, the Pope. And many of them are lining up and even allow the Catholic priest to teach in their, in their congregation. There you can see <coughs> from left. James Robinson and his wife, Betty Robinson, high profile pro, pro, the, the Protestant delegation it was called. You see Kenneth Copeland right in front there. And uh, then there is Reverend Jeff Tunnicliffe Tunnic right in the back. And uh, Brian Stiller, Thomas Schrimmer, also from World Evangelical Eva Alliance. And also our own Reverend John Arnott and his wife Carol from the Toronto Airport Christian Fellowship. All of them, they said it was a great miracle to meet the Pope. There is a big difference between the God Roman Catholics serve and our we serve. There cannot be compromise. Their Bible has 17 more books. They worship Mary. They say she is a co-redeemer with Lord Jesus Christ. They call her, they call Mary the Queen of Heaven. We cannot even overlook the differences. And mainly, it says, Pope is here in this world in the place of Lord Jesus Christ. How can we even agree to get together? We cannot even agree. If you read the second uh, ep, uh, letter of John, John 2, it's only one chapter. He says, you should not even wish hello to them. That's how you should stay far away. And now as we go to 17.8, 
the beast that thou sawest was and is not shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. This is the beast, the antichrist. The person who is being addressed is the power behind the beast, the devil. It is the devil who is going to be in the bottomless pit for thousand years during the millennium rule when Lord Jesus is going to rule here. The remaining earth habitants are the big fans of this beast right now. And uh, here the address, the, the Bible is addressing in 17.8 is describing the devil which is the power uh, behind the beast. And then 17.9, here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. We already saw who is the city on seven hills. We have concluded based on the seven clues given in the first in four to six verses of 17th chapter that it is Rome or Vatican both meaning the same thing. And these are seven, there are seven kings, five are fallen and one is the other is not yet come and when he cometh he must continue a short space and the beast that was and is not even eight and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. The seven um, heads are not only the mountains, but also seven kings, physical and allegorical meanings. We have to consider both. Seven heads are seven mountains and seven kings and seven kingdoms. That is how the Bible uses it. Daniel uses kings and kingdoms interchangeably. If you read the book of Daniel, seventh, eight, ninth chapters. Five world governments ruled the world until the Roman Empire, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece. The Roman Empire is the sixth kingdom. This is the government which is expressed here. He says here, you see five are fallen, the other is yet to come and when he must come, he must continue a sh short space. And the beast which was and is not even is the eighth and is of the seven that go it into perdition. <coughs> the seven heads are also seven kings, historic, present and future. The eighth king is the beast himself. The king who has not yet come, but when he comes must continue a short time, refers to the, if you remember, one of the heads of the beast dies and the antichrist revives him. Do you remember that? That will be the final ruler. Daniel gives two subject, two different lessons in Daniel 2 and 7. Daniel 2 talks about the ten toes in the, in the feet of the, um, of the statue. In chapter uh, 7, four animals represent four kingdoms. And then 17.12 he says, and the ten horns which thou sawest are the ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. You see, remember the beast having ten horns? Horns are always inter interpreted in scripture as kings. If you want to, uh, to understand Bible allegory, we need to understand large bodies of waters as people, horns as kings. There are ten kings gathering together um, for Armageddon. We saw in the end of 16th chapter that all the armies are coming to a place called Medigo near Jerusalem and gathering for the fight against Lord Jesus Christ. And um, these, there are 10 kings among them, kings of East from across the Euphrates who will join the fight. This is part of the final kingdom of the vision shown to Daniel. The final sh uh, kingdom shall be mixed with clay and iron with ten toes. The mix of the Roman Empire itself and these kings from all over the world will in turn support the Holy Roman Empire. They will be thinking they are going to find a fight a holy battle. They will, they, it says in 17.4, they shall make war with the lamb and 
and the lamb will overcome them for he is lord of lords and the king of kings and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful the battle of armageddon will be a great battle fought in the face of the earth i estimate uh, more than 200 million soldiers will take past part against the almighty god they will believe they will be uh, made to believe a lie which says they are fighting against the devil but actually they will be fighting against lord jesus and the Lord Jesus is the King of Kings and uh, Lord of Lords. These people will make a war. They will make a fa fatal mistake of fighting with the Lamb and Lord Jesus will overcome them. And then he says the war, uh, in 17.15, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes, nations and tongues. This is how you interpret, this is how you interpret the scripture. Here is the wisdom of scripture. How you interpret scripture? The waters where the whore sitteth are the peoples, the multitudes, nations and tongues. We can use this to understand other parts of scripture. Because some part of scripture is very allegorical. We have to carefully understand. You see, and the ten whores which thou sawest in the beast shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. This is the end of the spiritual part of the Roman Catholic Church. Till now, the Roman Catholic Church had not been touched. In fact, it was used as a vehicle to bring all religions together. The armies of the world were united under it. The ten kings who come in support for the Antichrist actually heart hate this church or Babylon or the woman who rides the beast. They are going to destroy it completely. This is what the devil does. He uses people, he uses authorities till his work is done. After that, he will turn, the peop turn on the people and the authorities and destroy them. With the devil, there is always destruction. John 10.10, 10, the Bible says, he, the thief comes to kill, steal and destroy. But with God, li it is life everlasting. The very church which was used to form this one world religion, one world government is no longer needed. So, they will, will allow it to be destroyed. The Roman Empire which was, was, was the vehicle to usher in the last days, the battle will carry, um, uh, the, to carry the DNA of, uh, of the devil will be destroyed. This is the spiritual destruction and the physical destruction will be shown in the next chapter when we come, uh, when we go next week. As you see, the, the, she will be destroyed. You see in Revelation 17, 17, the Bible says, For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and to give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of the Lord shall be fulfilled. God will take away the power from the Roman Catholic Church, and hand it over to these kings. And they will have power with the beast for a little while. After that, they will also be destroyed. Whatever the devil plans, whatever the devil thinks, God is in final control. Amen? He uses the very kings the devil used to, um, to fight against him to destroy the Roman Catholic Church. The ten kings, as you see the ten toes in the statue, are, will be with the, with the Antichrist. Ultimately, it is the word of God which shall stand. Amen? Amen. Any questions? Good question. R Brother Ravi's question is, why will the kings hate the Roman Catholic Church in which they have done it together? They have come to fight together. That is, answer is in Revelation 17, 16. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. 17, 17 says, God has put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and there give their kingdoms unto the beast until the word shall be fulfilled. See, God will change, put it in their hearts to kill, to destroy the Roman Catholic Church. That's why they will start to hate, Brother Ji. But then in the reading world, say the woman with the thighs with the weight to bring the penis over the beast. Yeah, that he, they're giving the evidence, as I told you in the beginning of the presentation. What is that city? It is the, what is, who is that woman? 
it is the great city, it is the identification only, the 18th verse is just the identification of the city. The idea is not of the length of the building. Okay, the, should I repeat the question so everybody understand? Yeah, it's part of another question is why did God allow such high rise buildings to be built now but not to Nebro? Okay, the, they are the, the, the good questions. Uh, there are couple of questions about this. Let me answer one by one. Uh, I will just go to the question here so I can read it out. Uh, Brothers, uh, Sanjeev has asked, how taller the, uh, uh, you know, the Tower of Babylon would be that uh, it could not be taller than the tallest buildings today. It's true. The key was the one people united. If all the world gathered together to build a tower, you are creating, recreating the conditions of Babel. You see, that is the rebellion against God. And that is in a way that is what they are going to do in Armageddon and God is going to destroy them. But um, today he has, he has allowed us to build because we are building individually, we are not all together gathering to build or we are not of one mind to build it. That is the big difference. The, if you see uh, Acts 17, 26-27, the idea behind scattering people is so that they will focus on God. That was the idea behind it. Yeah, today because we are not doing united. There is no comparison to that time. Yeah, because when people gather together, they will start to do evil and then they will not stop from doing what they wanted to do. If you see, um, as you come to uh, Genesis 5th, uh, 6th chapter, when Noah was there, the Bible says that the people were, their imagination were constantly evil. That is what God destroyed them. Whenever it becomes like that, when all the world is focusing on evil, God will destroy it. And that is what will happen in these last days. Yeah, one is, yeah, sixth one is the current one at that time, the Rome. Uh, Roman Empire. Seventh one is going to come, which is the uh, Antichrist Empire. And then the eighth one will come. Eighth one will be the beast itself, where the devil will rule after the thousand year reign is released. That is the beast. Andre asked me a question, any idea who the ten kings are? We have no idea who the ten kings are. There is no... Um, indication who those 10 kings are, but we think, I think from what I have read, it may be some of the kings of the east and some of the European kings, uh, USA and Canada are not mentioned, they will be destroyed before this happens. We do not know. That is God's plan, I, we do not know why. He will, whatever remaining inhabitants of the world, he will take to fight against God, the last fight. We will see that in the 19th chapter, you will see 1920th chapter. The question was, uh, why should the come back after the millennium rule of Christ? He will come back to fight against Christ. We will see that. He will gather the rest of the inhabitants of the earth to fight against Christ. 